to Westminster Open Lens, part of our reboot series at the start of the parliamentary session. Uh, our next contribution is from uh, Philip Blonde, who is the director of Respublica, a think tank and political activist, uh, founded in 2009, uh, had a very significant impact uh, in the public debate. But we're here today to look at uh, the year ahead. What is the story uh, underlying, underlying the causes uh, that are disrupting political parties and political structures here and across Europe? Uh, some insights to that. Uh, we look forward to them. Over to you, Philip. No, uh, thank you very much. Um, what I want to suggest is there are proximate uh, and more distant causes. But I think the primary cause of all of this is the failure of liberalism as the governing policy uh, agenda for the West. And this failure of liberalism has two characteristics. It's first of all marked by its almost overwhelming success as a governing philosophy um, <clears throat> post the 1970s um, failure of uh, social democracy, both in Britain and increasingly um, in Europe. And then it's almost hegemonic status um, in uh, the Thatcher-Reagan worldview. Largely, modern liberalism began, first of all, with social liberalism, uh, introduced uh, by the left in the 1960s, and then moved on to economic liberalism, and then the union of the two in Blur, Cameron, et al. Now, what's interesting is that the promise of liberalism is to secure all the goods for everybody, uh, the goods of a modern, successful, cosmopolitan life. And it's exactly this that liberalism has failed to do. And liberalism, I would argue, uh, in its extreme forms, which are the forms that have governed us and which still do govern us, is the primary cause and agent of instability uh, in the West. Because we still assume that in the face of uh, populism, in the face of now even uh, the rise of, of genuine fascism again, more liberalism is the answer, which is akin to pouring oil, uh, much more oil on the fire that's already uh, roaring. So, what has liberalism done? Essentially, what I want to argue is that liberalism has, in essence, produced mass insecurity, both economic and cultural. And that this insecurity uh, was, first of all, um, perpetuated on working class people and the working classes in the West, and gradually and increasingly is expanding to include uh, the middle classes as well. And the delivery vehicle for this form of liberalism, both social and economic, has largely been globalization, the rights agenda, et cetera, et cetera. Let me concentrate initially on what I view as the least causal of those great um, instigators of insecurity, economic. So economic liberalism promises, in a way, a massive opening of markets to all players, a reenfranchisement of all actors, and a delivery of an open, free uh, trading economic system that genuinely enhances um, all positions within it. It's very clear that we now have the opposite of that economically. What liberalism has, in fact, delivered us to is a level of oligopoly and monopoly that is utterly unthinkable, where we are producing monopoly trading platforms, monopoly asset ownerships, and all of these are driving not just income inequality, where you have wage stagnation uh, for some sectors of workers, not just since the crash uh, back in 2008, but back to the early 70s, uh, especially if you look at, for instance, at unskilled workers in the United States. And arguably, for certain groups of workers, if you look at purchasing power parity, their incomes haven't shifted or improved for 30 years. 
Now, on the watch of liberalism and on the watch of free markets, we have seen market monopolization. We have seen asset capture on an unprecedented scale. And if you think not of inequality just on the level of income, which roughly um, in the UK, the top decile of income is roughly, after the effects of welfare and redistribution, about 10 times uh, the income of the bottom decile. If you look at assets, it's 100 times. And if you go to the very top of that asset ownership group, it's 1,000 times, it's 10,000 times, it's 100,000 times. And what we are essentially doing uh, under the auspices of free markets is, I would argue, refeudalizing the economy. In a modern sense, we are recreating the lord and serfdom bondage that define the Middle Ages, not the modern age. And that is because ownership and the ability to leverage and the ability to gain more of ownership is producing land holdings and power that makes the medieval lords pale um, uh, by comparison. Now, this, the effect of this market cum rentier economy is everybody is converted into somebody who essentially can just carry debt. As Wolfgang Strake argues, modern capitalism ha have become debt-enfranchised economies which produce debt and pushes that debt both onto future generations, but moreover, onto its own populations in increasing numbers. Now, this level of insecurity, economic, denies people access to homes, to long-paying, uh, stable jobs, to pensions, and recreates the need for a vast welfareism because it produces people at the end of their working lives who are pretty much as insecure as they were at the beginning of their working lives. Now, this obviously doesn't capture all, but it captures an increasing number of people and an increasing amount. But what's interesting, if you analyze the Brexit vote, the Trump vote, the vote for Front National, for Alternative for Deutschland, for the Five Star Movement, for the Northern League, um, for uh, the Freedom Party in Austria, is that actually those who vote for populist parties largely don't vote for them because of economic reasons. Economic marginalization is a secondary cause, and the primary cause is cultural insecurity, not economic insecurity. And the thing that has provoked this cultural move above and beyond anything else, as Ivan Krasnich has argued in his wonderful book, After Europe, is migration. And migration is the mark and is the great deliverer of a social reaction to social liberalism. And if social liberalism can be identified with migration and arguments for migration, which it can be uh, quite successfully, the reaction to it is what most animates the populist parties. Now, what drives this cultural reaction isn't simply racism um, and largely isn't racism. It's the perception that the newcomer is the fracture of your social solidarity. Because what's interesting, Mark, of liberalism is liberalism has no concept of social solidarity. It's only uh, dedicated to autonomy, and autonomy only works if you're wealthy, you're powerful, and you can escape the social bonds. But for those who aren't wealthy and powerful, social solidarity is crucial. If you're in a low-paid job, you don't have enough income to pay for childcare, you're reliant upon your extended family to help you look after uh, your babies in order that you can go out to work and just make ends meet. But migration, as perceived as a threat to social cohesion, as a threat to identity, is essentially a minority threat to majorities. And because majorities perceive liberalism as essentially empowering majorities at the, uh, uh, minorities at the expense of majorities, the mark of democracy now is no longer care for the excluded minority concern. It's now become threatened majorities who aren't prepared to have the elite elevate minorities over their interests. So across Europe, across America, and indeed in the UK, what you have are strong forms of identity and solidarity perceived to be threatened by migration and the sense that these people will end the world 
the social, collective, communitarian world on which they rely for their personal security and their familial security. Now, this sense of threat is also has very strong uh, echoes within demography. Pew Research has recently shown that the Muslim population of uh, Sweden will be a third of the Swedish population by 2050, which will, by any measure, completely change the character of Sweden. And what particularly um, those classes that feel threatened feel threatened by is the sense that they will be unhomed in their own land, that they will be strangers in their father's country, that this spirit, this almost sacral spirit uh, of um, ethnic identity that they share and that makes possible peace and security between them will essentially end through migration. And what's really interesting if you look at migration is migration is probably the most single successful agent of regime change in the world. Migration is far more successful than military intervention and is by far the most successful um, intervention that one can have. Roughly speaking, since the um, European Convention on Refugees, which I think is 1951, there have been 75 mass migrations uh, instigated by states or non-state actors. Over half of those migrations achieved all of their aims and all of their ends. Migration as a tool of regime change outcompetes everything else. Now, in places like Central Europe, like Poland, which used to be highly multi-ethnic, used to be a third Ukrainian, third Jewish, third Polish, or places like Hungary, or Slovakia, or the Czech Republic, see migration now as essentially a form of threat to their social value systems and their systems of solidarity. And the enormously popular regimes that rule there now rule because of social solidarity. And in interpreting migration as a future threat to such social solidarity, those countries have academia on their side. Those countries uh, have anthropology on their side. It's very clear that migration, especially mass migration, is sponsored by liberal cosmopolitanism, rewrites the rule book for nations. Now, for those nations which don't integrate or aren't able to integrate and make new communities or new Britons or new Americans of the migrant populations, their social system does not survive. And that's largely because of what I call the free rider problem. Because people who are coming in are viewed as people who don't make a contribution and then essentially get welfare and get rewarded. And what's interesting about the free rider problem is recent research has shown even babies penalize free riders. Even babies within social settings recognize and penalize people who cost the society and make no contribution towards it. And unfortunately for migrants, the countries they move into haven't adopted or created any system that would enable them to be seen not as free riders, but as in many cases, those who make great contributions, which of course they do. So to conclude, almost everybody gets the big uh, trends wrong. And the big trends, uh, firing populism, aren't going to end anytime soon. I've seen some security reports on migration out of northern Africa into Europe that suggest 30 to 50 million people will move because of climate change and water. Countries that are the recipient of those migrant flows will not survive that level of, um, of movement. Until we could actually have the discussion about social solidarity, which we're incapable of having in a liberal framework, we are not going to be able to defend ourselves against the fascist solutions that are already quite close. And then when fascism is seen as a response to, to the insecurity that liberalism has created, both economic and social, it's imperative that we create non-liberal solutions that can actually safeguard against a fascist uh, legacy being
being created. And until we can address these causes, we are nowhere. And we are at the brink of something very, very extreme. It won't be like the 1930s, but it won't be unlike the 1930s. Thank you.